again, like you can point to all these things like, you know, using mascots and using the right social media apps and, you know, trying to generate buzz or doing the right pop-up shops and stuff. But if you do it without an understanding of your audience and who's coming, then it's not going to resonate at all. So really, again, getting back to basics of why they're going to be interested in you to begin with. Konnichiwa, minasan. Business Success Japan no podcast yokoso. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Business Success Japan podcast. This is your host, Lydia Bukelman. My main goal here is to create an easily accessible resource for those who want to develop Japan specific communication skills, especially in business. While I can't and won't promise to make you fluent in Japanese, I hope that you will walk away from each episode with a skill, piece of information, or shift in mindset that will help you be more effective in your interactions with Japanese business people. Before we get into the episode, I wanted to thank another person who's taken the time to rate and review the show. RC Pastry CHF, which I assume stands for RC Pastry Chef, said, Superb and to the point. Thank you for this podcast. I've been in Tokyo for just over a year, and this is an incredible and interesting insight. Thank you so much for taking the time to review the episode. And if you haven't already, please go ahead and subscribe, rate, and review if possible in whatever podcast app you are using. All right, so let's go over a little bit of Japanese before we get into the interview today. In the previous episode, we learned a phrase that's very important to Japanese culture ku ki o yomu. Ku, u, ki, o, yo, mu. Ku, ki, o, yo, mu. This phrase means to read the air, which is an essential skill if you want to be effective in Japan. Today's phrase is another word that is closely tied to Japanese culture and communication. Honne. Ho, n, ne. Honne. This word refers to what someone is really thinking or feeling, as opposed to what they may be expressing to other people. It can also be translated as real intention or motive. This concept and its counterpart will hopefully be discussed in the next episode of this podcast, so be sure to watch out for that one to learn even more. So now, I'm really excited to share today's conversation with you. My guest is Natalie Meyer, founder of the successful localization and market research company Tokyo Esque. Although currently based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, Natalie is a native Californian with an extensive history of living and working in other countries, including Japan. I hope that you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. Hi, everybody. I'm Natalie Meyer, and I'm the founder and CEO of Tokyo Esque, which is a uh, market research and localization agency dealing with the Japanese market. And what we do is we help. Japanese businesses that are going into the UK and more broadly the European markets and UK and European businesses that are doing the same into Japan. And I founded it in 2014. And at the moment, I'm actually based out of Amsterdam since we started a Dutch branch for the business in January. So London, Amsterdam based, but working probably 50% with Japanese clients and 50% with non Japanese. Yeah, that's very interesting. So you work kind of with localization going both ways or mostly for European countries into Japan? So we do do it both ways, but I've noticed that it's much more in demand for um, European businesses going into Japan. Our Japanese clients tend to want more information from us, something I'm sure you're used to as well. Much more about data points and getting as much information and planning together as possible. So for our Japanese clients, we might be doing a lot of research into innovations around Europe. Or for example, we were working on the Tokyo 2020 Olympics and analyzing how big events around the world have been planned for them, that kind of thing. But localization and research for actual expansion into a country is what we do a lot of for our European clients that want to enter Japan or do better in Japan. Yeah, I can see how that's something that's very, Japan can be such a unique, unique market to say the least for outsiders to get into. So then how did you get involved with Japan with your background? Yeah, I mean, so I started studying Japanese in school. I'm actually from California, from the Bay Area, and I was kind of surrounded by that 
Silicon Valley mentality as I was growing up. But also I had the opportunity to study Japanese and it, I just stuck with it really. It became my first overseas experience going to Japan. And when I was in university, I ended up, while I was still studying Japanese, I ended up doing an internship, which just so happened to be in market research in Tokyo with a、um, great small company that was doing quite similar stuff to what we do now. And that was almost, I mean, yeah, it was just by chance. I didn't intend to get into that industry. I just really liked that when I was speaking Japanese, I could almost discover parts of the world that just aren't available to you otherwise, because I was meeting people who had never spoken to someone at sometimes who wasn't Japanese. And I realized because they don't speak English, it's just not available to anyone else that can't speak Japanese. So that was my sort of introduction into it. I guess that discovery phase of another culture really drew me to it. Yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense. So, what sorts of things do you feel like you were able to discover? Was it just being able to find people in the first place that maybe other people don't have access to just due to linguistic barriers? Or was it a mindset or a deeper understanding of the culture? That's a good question. I think a lot of it had to do with. Uh, yeah, the access to different types of people that was an eye opener for me because even though California may look very diverse, I think the American mentality is still very much you know, entrenched there, and people are expected to act American if you're, if you're working or living there. So, seeing a different way of acting that was really interesting to me. And another part of it, I think, was almost self discovery based. So, Seeing that I could act differently in a different language and culture, that was quite eye opening to me. And it, yeah, especially because I had grown up in quite a diverse family. Like my mother is Russian and my father's family is originally from Jewish Iraq, but I was never told that that was diverse. That was just normal because they wanted to assimilate and become American after that. So I think I noticed different parts of myself through getting involved in Japan. And realized that maybe this was kind of there all along, if that makes any sense at all, but by exploring this completely different culture. Yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense. So then, is it that you kind of realized, oh, my cultural stuff is, I mean, it's not arbitrary, but it is socially constructed. So just realizing, like, oh, things don't have to be a certain way, they can be another way. You felt like、yeah. that deepened your experience and understanding of other people, maybe. Yeah, and a lot of, I mean, one of the key words that I use all the time is awareness. Being aware of these differences, I think, is really important. And I mean, I was lucky enough to still be a teenager when I started working with Japan. So I was able to really get into that and, and sort of understand it in a way that I think might be harder if, if I'd started doing it now, for instance. So then, can you tell us a little bit more about? The work specifically you do right now. You mentioned a lot of market research and helping companies be more effective in new cultural contexts. Yeah, so we're basically quite a multicultural team that has had experiences with Japan, but also a lot of other parts of the world. And that lends itself well to the kind of projects that we end up working on. So a lot of our work at the moment is very.、Um, I, we call it cultural insight based. So, as an example, we have some clients that are going into the Japanese market and might have already localized their website into Japanese, but haven't really had the chance to look at it through the lens of Japanese culture and consumer needs. So, we'll often step in to say, okay, well, maybe you're technically translating your message here, but are you really resonating with your audience and in what you're saying? Is there better? Tone that you could use, or is there, you know, a different imagery that might work better with this website and really communicate better to your audience? So, really thinking about who it's for and、um, bringing our cultural experience and knowledge into that when we do it. So, that's a lot of what we're, we're working on at the moment. And then, often, we'll work on bigger market research projects for quite large brands like Google or Spotify and things like that, where They might already be in the Japanese market, but、um, they want a more fine tuned understanding of what their consumer is. 
So we'll speak a lot directly to Japanese consumers and understanding, you know, why do they stream music this way? And what are their habits and what might be appealing to them that isn't being presented them to them yet from the client? That kind of um, understanding of how to maximize the messaging with the Japanese market. So I'd say, yeah, those are probably two of the biggest types of projects we work on for our European clients. I just wanted to go back a second to what you mentioned earlier about being on a diverse team. Sure. So do you have some difficulties working in a cross-cultural team? I know that there are unique challenges and unique benefits from that sort of situation, or because you all have those experiences with Japan, you have enough commonalities that you don't have hmm. um, extra um, difficulties. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like to be optimistic <laughs> and mm -hmm. a lot of the times I think that yes we have had all these diverse experiences so we do understand each other but um, you still have to be careful and make sure that everyone is getting what they need out of you know working for Tokyo Esque as well so sometimes um, for example in Japanese business culture it's common to not really say you know that you reject something or that you don't agree with something and even if some of my researchers might have lived outside Japan for many years, I still notice them deferring to that um, act, sort of Japanese business culture etiquette. And I have to be the one to realize that they're doing that and they really mean no when they're saying, oh, sure, I can do that. So that kind of awareness is really necessary. I'm trying to think about other ex examples of situations like that. And I think also just myself, because I'm from the U.S. originally, I'm very aware that my management style or my business style is different even from the U.K. and the Netherlands, never mind Japan. So, yeah, just trying to communicate constantly and make sure that everyone's on the same page. How do you kind of maintain that awareness of your own cultural because yours is a little bit of a hybrid. So how do you maintain awareness of, oh, this is what I tend to do because of my cultural context? What can you do to kind of be aware of that? Right. Well, I mean, I, I am quite a curious person. So I read a lot of books on this kind of thing. And one that I really recommend is called The Culture Map by Erin Meyer. Yes, I and, love that one. Yeah. And she goes into examples of not just Japanese business culture, but all sorts of cultures and how they interact with each other. So that kind of reading and study, I think, is really useful for it. Um, and then the other side of it is I do a lot of yoga and meditation. So maybe I've gotten a bit better, just a little bit better at stepping back and seeing, you know, what's going on externally and then trying to get involved in the situation rather than doing it first. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Kind of that developing the space between situation where you can actually yeah. notice things definitely helps. Yeah. And it's also easier for me to do because I'm interested in it. Like this is why I started Tokyo Ask. I think cultural differences are one of the most important things, but also it's, it's a great advantage if you understand them um, and can help promote a, a positive form of globalization around the world. So it's, it's not difficult for me to focus on, although maybe in execution, sometimes it can be difficult. <laughs> right. You're still only human, even though you love the work, obviously oh, yeah. you can't be perfect all the time. So then what sorts of things do you do to help companies effectively engage and serve the Japanese consumer? Is it mostly just helping them find awareness or giving them specific things that they should do? Yeah, so I often talk about us as if we're almost therapists for our clients, because even though they're saying they want, you know, data and information, at least for our European clients, a lot of the times what I think they are really looking for is reassurance. You know, are they making the right choices um, maybe not just from a business sense, but even a more like relationship based sense. So uh, we try to step back and guide them in that, in that way, which they probably don't even realize when they're coming to us, this is what they're looking for. Um, that's been quite a highlight of what we do. And uh, I'm just thinking about for our Japanese clients, how, how is it? I think a lot for them, it's more overt familiarity that we have with markets that they know that they aren't as comfortable in. Um, we'll often have Japanese clients coming over to London or elsewhere in Europe and we'll be doing tours for them 
that are business based. So what are new innovations and new building developments and trends and things like that. And they're, they often ask for an interpreter, but what they really mean when they want an interpreter is someone who's from that locale and can help to interpret what's happening around them, not just language based. So giving that again, I, it's similar, isn't it? It's a sense of reassurance that they're mm-hmm. looking for. I love that mindset of kind of sneakily being a therapist for these companies. That's such a great <laughs> way to approach it. Yeah, it's it's interesting as well because, I mean, sometimes you think you're solving one problem, but you're really solving an entirely different one. Mm-hmm. And other times it can be quite frustrating because you're very clear on what they should do and you can see what would resonate the most with the Japanese audience but they're still not doing it but that's also because they're dealing with lots of other factors and forces within their own department and business so yeah we have to juggle all of that Mm -hmm. oh that has to be so frustrating sometimes so then um can you tell us a little bit about some of the characteristics that make the japanese market unique especially for european companies going into the country I mean, there's a lot of what you hear everywhere, you know, that relationships are very important there. Um, It really is important. And things like, um, I mean, I'd really say one of the most unique things is that Japan has the ability to kind of act on its own. It can be isolated and it can be a Galapagos island and still function. Maybe that's changing nowadays as they see that they want to become more global, but I think a lot of the Japanese clients that we deal with have this almost unconscious mindset that they don't really need to be involved outside Japan. And one of the key things I look for in our clients is, are they open and curious about it? And if they are, then I can see that we can help them and can do good work for them. But even even they are usually dealing with people among their team that don't see the need for it. So that's, I think, one of the biggest struggles with dealing with Japan. So do you notice any qualities that tend to be consistent with companies that are more open? Does it tend to come down to age or is it more just the co- how the corporate culture pans out? I, I would like to say it's age, but I re- actually don't think it is because mm-hmm. a lot of the younger Japanese generation are also very you know, domestic and inward facing. So it it probably has a bit more to do with the experiences that they've had. And that could be from the older generation as well. It's more likely that the older generation is someone that maybe is very used to the Japanese way and doesn't want to change as much, whereas the younger might be more willing to change. But I've noticed it across all generations. Yeah, I think that yeah I'd, I'd probably say like when I'm, I'm looking for that openness it's what kind of experiences have they had outside Japan and how much do they want to engage with something that is different from them that's really important but then do you kind of find difficulties coming up from kind of the consensus culture within companies is that often a barrier yeah and it takes a lot of time as well to really understand what's going on within an organization I've noticed that, yeah, I I often I'm looking for that person that can bridge within that organization the way we bridge, you know, from one company to another. So like recently with one of my big Japanese clients, they've had a new consultant come in that's being tasked to change the way they work and be more global. And they now it's their job. So we can sort of assist them and be their support and guides along with that. Because what Tokyo-esque ends up bringing often is data points and reassurance that can help them to then advocate for that within their company. So yeah, we definitely see that struggle, but we try to support it if we find the right person that's looking to do that. And we see it in European organizations as well. So a lot of work that we've been doing recently has been in the iGaming industry, and they'll often have a Japanese country manager who, you know, understands how Western business works and is expected to help propel the company into the Japanese market. And sometimes they're not getting the support that they need because the European managers are saying, okay, um, just do this. It should be that easy. Mm. (laughs) And they know that it's not that easy in Japan, but just telling them that or, you know, trying to find ways around it often doesn't work very well. So we've come in at some points and given 
evidence that, you know, this is what needs to be done. And that helps them, again, to advocate for the right path for market entry or whatever it is they're doing. Apart from these people, these individuals who clearly have the title of managing this specific market, what do you tend to look for in trying to discover this bridge in companies? Is it somebody who's a little bit higher up who has um, intercultural experiences? What do you tend to look for when you're trying to discover this bridge? Yeah, a lot of my connections in Japanese business have come through kind of introductions from introductions. So I get to know someone and then they trust me and that's why they introduce me to someone else. So I, I think often if that a relationship has been built and nurtured on both our parts, then I already trust them and they can see that, that I'm bringing something to the table and Tokyo is bringing something to the table that's slightly different and more open and global than they might be used to. So yeah, they become our advocates in that sense. And I'm just thinking how I actually meet and identify those people. It's just the people that I notice are curious and, you know, want to speak to me and asking questions about not being Japanese, but speaking Japanese and getting a little bit past that formulaic, oh, you use chopsticks so well, <laughs> type of talking. When I notice that, that's when I think this is someone that I, I want to keep talking to and, and we can grow something. All right. So it sounds like they almost reveal themselves to you, which is great. Yeah. And the context I'm often doing it in now is, well, I mean, now I'm in Amsterdam, but before I was living in London for eight years. So they were often Japanese people who are already a little, you know, out of their comfort zone. So if they find someone, like I would go to a lot of Japanese meetups for, you know, the Japanese Chamber of Commerce and sort of nomikai and drinking events that are almost feel like you're in the middle of Tokyo, but in London. And they're very aware that they're not in Japan, but when they see someone that speaks Japanese and isn't Japanese, they are, tend to gravitate towards me, I think. I, that's one of the lucky things that I've had with being able to build this business. And that's how I kind of, you know, start to build the relationship with them. They kind of come to me in a sense. It's really interesting how it happens. That's a really good thing to know, though, because people seem to think that um, maybe investing their time in learning Japanese isn't the most efficient because as soon as they leave Japan, oh, I won't be able to use it anymore. So maybe it's not worth investing all of this energy in. But it's interesting that you still find that Japanese people gravitate towards you outside of Japan, too, just because of yeah. your language skills. I mean, I also make an effort to get involved in those circles and it's also important to know that they exist, right? I think a lot of people don't even know that um, London, Dusseldorf, and Amsterdam are the biggest cities for Japanese expats in Europe. And there's just massive ecosystems around that. But once you know it's there, it's, it's actually easy to get involved if you do understand the culture. Yeah, that's so awesome. Definitely a good thing to know is just to seek out these communities no matter where you live. When I was studying for my master's degree in London about eight years, 10 years ago now, I was um, going to my alumni event because I had studied abroad at Waseda University in Tokyo and they had Waseda events oh, <laughs> in wow. the middle of London. And going to that was a way that I first fostered my network there. And it was really interesting again to see and having to do a, introductions in Japanese as the only white person in the room was really interesting as well. I just felt like I was in the middle of Tokyo, it was insane. But then over the years, I kept going and I started to notice that there were a few other non-Japanese people joining as well. So I think maybe people are becoming more aware of these events as well and maybe more interested in Japan too. Yeah, hopefully that trend can continue well once the pandemic is over and we're cool. able to all hang out again. So then can you tell us a little bit more about what might make market entry into Japan so difficult for outside companies? You mentioned this sort of domestic mindset that companies in Japan can be prone to have. Is there anything else? Yeah, I mean, along with that domestic mindset, it's this, I, I mean, idea that, you know, they might already have the relationships that they need and that what they're looking for is already in Japan. So if, I think it, that means it's really important to do your research into who are your competitors and what are your clients or your consumers already doing to fulfill that need that you offer. So, 
I think that makes it more important in some markets that you've done that kind of initial feasibility testing and competitor analysis. Yeah, that's a big one. And what else makes it difficult is, again, like, people always talk about it, but I do think it's true, is the idea that you need to have the right relationships in Japan. And it, it helps if you speak Japanese, but you don't necessarily need to. But you need to show that care and um, interest in nurturing a relationship with someone. So as an example, <laughs> I had a client, because I also used to work in software development, and I decided I would introduce one of our startup founder clients to one of my Japanese clients because I could see that there was a good match there. And the Japanese client is actually a really um, big investor in startup technology outside of Japan. So it would have been a massive benefit for my American client. And I took him along to this meeting. I know the Japanese counterpart was really interested in his service and his product, but the person that I brought, he was American and he was so, he didn't leave the right space for pauses for the person to ask questions. He would talk over him because the Japanese person didn't speak very good English. So when he sensed that kind of lack of confidence, I think the American person tried to jump in by just talking because it was making him uncomfortable. And even worse, he didn't follow up after the meeting. He probably thought it didn't go very well, or he thought, what's the point in focusing on it? when I could really see that if he had just nurtured that relationship a little bit, this was a really big opportunity for them, potentially millions in investment. But no, he didn't see the sort of short-term gain there. So he stepped out and the Japanese client was just a bit confused. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I decided after that, I'm not, I don't introduce startups to my Japanese clients again until I see that they're prepared to put in that work to build the relationship. And again, it doesn't mean they need to understand Japanese business or even Japanese business culture so much, but just be more like, yeah, aware and calm throughout the entire encounter and willing to kind of hear what the other person is saying and maybe doubt your own perception of it so that you can re read between the lines. I think is what I mean. Yeah. This openness and being able to notice things is definitely an important part of being successful in Japan. I just had an interview with Byron Baron. I'm not sure if you've connected with him yet. And he just talked about the concept of ma and we touched on kuki o yomu and things like that. So all yeah. very important things to be aware of in Japanese culture. Yeah, it is. It's so different as well because growing up in the US, like part of your value is about how you can fill those spaces rather than just leaving them. So it's completely counter to some people's intuitions because of what they've grown up around. Yeah, because I'm still based in the U.S. And if you left those kind of pauses in a conversation, everybody's just super uncomfortable. So your job while you're listening is to also be formulating what you're going to say next. Just a very different approach to conversation. Yeah, that is so true. And I think, interestingly, there are a lot of similarities between the U.K. and Japanese cultural mindset. Like a bit of that reserve exists in the U.K. as well. But it, moving to the Netherlands, I think it is a little bit more American in tone. I don't know if they would appreciate it if I said that. <laughs> but <laughs> I remember moving here. I was speaking to someone who is Dutch but had lived in Japan for a long time. He speaks Japanese. And I said to him that I understand British business culture. I understand Japanese and American business culture. But I'm less certain about Dutch business culture. How should I be acting here? And he kind of looked at me and said, well, why not just be yourself? <laughs> and I thought that was the most Dutch reply possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was quite funny. He didn't get why I was laughing. <laughs> my Oma, my grandma is a first generation immigrant from the Netherlands. So I get to see a little bit of that different. Well, she's been here since she was a child, but every once in a while you see those little things come out from her heritage culture too, which is really awesome. Yeah. And that's what I mean by, you know, even amongst my team, we might have all been living abroad for years, but still these, these habits come out that we didn't realize we still do intuitively. Yep. They're so foundational that everyone's going to be able to sneak out no matter how long you've lived somewhere else. Exactly. So that's why with the, like, uh, for example, the website localization work we do, or if you're even just taking a PowerPoint and putting it into Japanese, you need to really think about what 
are the messages that are underlying that that you don't even realize are there and why are you putting something together this way is it going to work for someone who doesn't speak english natively yeah for sure so then can you tell us a little bit about what role social media plays in the japanese marketplace um the, yeah this is and probably a lot of your the people that you interviewed talk about this as well but buzz and trend following and you know the opinion of the group it is slightly or massively more important in japan compared to some other markets so social media is a way to really make that even louder that kind of sense of okay this is what's trending this is what people like i think that's a big part of it but another part of it is that because the japanese consumers we tend to deal with i think they are a bit more reserved and it's a bit difficult sometimes to draw out their opinions social media is a way to get past that reserve and it's really useful if you're looking for the the true beliefs that some people are are holding um whereas sometimes if we just interview people we need to spend a lot of time digging to really get to what what do they really mean here what do they really think but on social media if they're feeling anonymous they they're doing that more quickly and it, i mean you can see that even in examples of you know comparing facebook for japanese users versus non-japanese a lot of the time um japanese users might not use their own photo for for the picture and even things like using their full name i think i would say only in the last few years has it become a bit more common like that sort of need for privacy is definitely there so if social media can get through that then you can actually see a lot of um authenticity so it's important in gathering information but you mentioned that buzz is also a bigger driver in the japanese marketplace Yeah. Um so I think I mean Japan is is an island nation and it's you know even though it's got a massive population a lot of it is still quite homogenized. So if something is trending then it's I think a lot easier to see in Japan versus the US or even smaller countries like the UK. Um and social media like I was saying it just kind of acts as resonance for those trends. So what is it that people are excited about and i think instagram has done a really good job at promoting those trends as well so i always say that it's important that our clients are on these social media channels and communicating with their consumers so that they can be seen to be part of that buzz and then there's also like the japanese types of social media usage like line which is the equivalent to kind of whatsapp and what we might use in the west and that again is used differently than you might think and it's important that our clients understand that when they're getting involved in that yeah that makes a lot of sense so <laughs> then what are things that companies do that are effective in generating this kind of buzz because i know in the united states at least the most recent trend has been cultivating micro influencers is are there any trends that are currently effective in the japanese social media sphere so i mean influencers are quite important maybe micro not so much yet although we've noticed it is more important for some industries that we're working with that are maybe a bit more difficult to communicate the value proposition like i was saying we're doing a lot of i gaming projects which can be things like online casino and betting which is not very well known yet in Japan so we've been working with micro influencers to um work with our clients on that and that that's been interesting to see how that develops but and then the other side of things is i think a lot of western i i know i keep saying western i don't really like that phrase but i'm basically using it to mean non japanese companies i think a lot of those types of companies will look at japan and think oh this is what our audience is going to like so let's use this so as an example i had a client that was using a sumo character for their whole you know imagery of of what they do and their whole branding and it actually worked really well for them in europe <laughs> but in japan the japanese users they didn't even realize that the japanese didn't know it was a sumo character because it looked so different from what they expected so they thought they were ticking the boxes by having a really cute mascot character but they actually weren't utilizing it or taking advantage of it at all 
but we've been working with them on how to um, you know use mascots in a way that is interesting for Japanese users and so I, I think again like you can point to all these things like you know using mascots and using the right social media apps and you know trying to generate buzz or doing the right pop-up shops and stuff but if you do it without an understanding of your audience and who's coming then it's not going to resonate at all so really again getting back to basics of why they're going to be interested in you to begin with so can you name any of those reasons that Japanese consumers tend to have for being interested in companies? Are there any commonalities there? I, that's, I mean, it's quite a broad question. Yeah, it's sorry. Hone down into like a specific industry. So at the moment, we're doing a project on fruit, which is quite an interesting one, actually. And thinking about, you know, why would a Japanese person be interested in buying fruit in a convenience store, which I, I don't, we were kind of surprised at this project because I don't think most Japanese people would usually buy fruit in a convenience store. They might usually buy it in a supermarket. Mm -hmm. And what we've been thinking about is, okay, what would make it more engaging and exciting for them to do this? And we realized that the convenience store, you know, it's this sort of haven of trends. So things that are like quick and short and interesting and novel, you can find that there and if you can get fruit which is like a very basic product something that you don't think you could market but maybe you can if you could get fruit to have that kind of buzz then you have a chance to be successful with consumers who are maybe going to then buy fruit in a convenience store so a way to do it might be that they're using mascot characters to you know play up the cuteness of the the fruit or whatever it is and um Again, thinking about, yeah, just what is it that is going to create that hype amongst them? So it might be that something is cute. It might be that there's a limited edition campaign or that there's something that your friends are doing that you really want to do too. That, that kind of gener like production of an event, that's part of what we try to get our clients to think about. That's extremely interesting. It's why it's important to be aware of um, what role these different institutions play in Japanese culture, because in America, <laughs> convenience stores aren't exactly the trendiest place. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yes, being aware of what the perception of, is of these different markets, of these different channels is very important, because it obviously doesn't um, carry over very well into every single country you enter. That awareness yeah. is important. That's true. So, I mean knowing that you know you're going to find the cool new things in a convenience store and not supermarket is maybe something unique to Japan and also thinking about you know yeah where are we going to find specific things that will interest different demographics or segments like we're doing a lot of work recently with generation z and it, there's a bit of similarities with the more broad generation z around the world but they're still very japanese in a sense and yeah, looking for those outlets for them has been fun as well. So maybe they're interested in like, you know, using TikTok to have more of an authentic voice or they care a bit more about sustainability than you would see outside their demographic. And then thinking, okay, where is that stuff showing up in the Japanese market? Mm -hmm. And it's funny that you mentioned the sustainability thing after talking about convenience stores because mm -hmm. recently there's been such a push. I think it was Lawson, Natural Lawson or something. They're trying to ha incorporate a bunch of sustainability efforts, like having reusable containers to sell detergent and things like that. So seeing those yeah. trends come out of convenience stores is super interesting. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, I've also, I think a lot of the trends are quite top down as well. So, um, and I've noticed that while our clients maybe are interested in sustainable measures and trends around the world, it's, it's again, because they're trying to be a bit more global and understanding how to do things that in, in a new innovative way, it's not really yet been out of demand for consumer interest in sustainability. So that's, I think, a bit of a gap as well between Japan and the rest of the world in terms of sustainability. So then for all of these potential difficulties that companies might have entering into the Japanese market, do you see any 
potential opportunities in the country that may not exist so much in other countries, especially the, in Europe? Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities. I mean, one of them is, again, I keep talking about Japan's push to be more global and more you know, involved in the world, but that's something that a lot of companies can take advantage of. Like, you don't necessarily need to pretend to be a Japanese brand to get into the Japan market. You can balance this sort of knowledge and familiarity with Japan and respect for it with your own sort of um, non-Japanese image. And that's something that I think is really important when they're getting into the market to take advantage of. So there's that. And then there's obviously key industries like I talked a bit about iGaming, but the integrated resorts industry, which is popping up, which will allow for more sort of entertainment hubs around Japan. And that will require a lot of expertise from outside Japan as well to build up these massive entertainment complexes and things like the Olympics and the world rugby that's just happened. I mean, even if the Olympics doesn't happen, which I really hope it will, even if it doesn't happen, it's put a lot of focus on Japan as a country that is, you know, interesting. And it's always had this image of being, you know, tech versus the past, but um, they have a chance to be in the spotlight with this. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to get involved in that side of things. And then the other thing I always like to say is that Japan is still considered one of the leading trendsetters within Asia. So if a brand is in Japan and their reputation is built there, then they can take that to, you know, China and South Korea and Thailand and really um, have a head start because the tourists from those countries have been swarming into Japan for many years now. And it's just insane how much um, interest there is in new Japanese technologies and um, fast fashion and beauty and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of opportunities there for companies that are thinking about it in terms of that way as well, communicating within Asia. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Um, it's something I hadn't actually thought about before that being successful in Japan provides a lot of social proof for other East Asian cultures as well yeah. if you want to break into them. I think a lot of companies put Japan off because they think, oh, it's so isolated, it's difficult. Um, I'm going to deal with, you know, the really big opportunity first, which might be China or the easier markets, like the ones that have more English um, infrastructure and things. But if they can put in that effort and make that commitment to Japan, it does pay off in the long run. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense because um, Japanese consumers have quite high standards. So if you can be successful yeah. in Japan, other, com other countries will be like, oh, if the Japanese like it, it has to be at least okay. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, I know a lot of people are, are going to be saying, well, what's going to happen with coronavirus and the impact of the pandemic? And we don't know, like it is true that tourism is halted at the moment. So you don't have these flows between the countries, but it, it was definitely a force that was building up until now. And I don't see why it wouldn't keep building up if things are able to reach some sort of new normality as well. Yeah, I don't see Japan becoming less of a tourist destination in the future either. I think it's going to have more of a resurgence once people can actually go and travel again. Yeah, and then you also have the image that Japan has around the world, like you were saying, for quality. And a lot of that focus has been on, you know, the mask wearing habit that the Japanese uh, society has and attention to hygiene, etc. So it has a big opportunity to kind of keep branding itself as the safe place to, for tourism for um, sure and, but again this is something that i've tried to talk to my japanese clients about because they're in the position to promote tourism as well and they want to do it but i think the, the pr sometimes is a bit difficult for them and thinking about things from that non-japanese perspective is also a bit difficult and mm -hmm. it's interesting with them because they're like oh yeah i never thought about it that way but then they don't really follow up with these different perspectives. They still, if you go to the Japanese tourism board website, it still looks very Japanese. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially the layouts can be a little bit overly Japanese, not so intuitive for people who yeah. are navigating from a different perspective. Yeah, it's true. I, I, mean, I mean, in a sense, you do want some of that because you get involved with another culture, you sightsee another culture because you want to see the difference, but 
you also want to feel comfortable in the way that you're doing it. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I know that a lot of the Japanese um, more local governments and prefectures want to attract tourism as well. And they have that classic problem of, you know, just not enough English speaking staff or even people that understand how to uh, yeah message to a tourist that this is an interesting fun place to visit and you'll be taken care of here it's not too japanese you know so that that's a hard balance to hit for places that really do want to build up their tourism yeah definitely so then would you mind sharing your favorite project that you're working on right now or a favorite project in the past well we've, uh, so we work on so many different projects yeah really surprised and happy that that's been the case it's hard to choose one but um, yeah picking a favorite child right now I you know I I mentioned earlier that that we've worked on a lot of um the Tokyo 2020 organizational work and understanding how to plan a big event based off you know how London 2012 was planned and Rio and Pyeongchang and one there was one specific project which was quite fun when I used to still get involved in the research side I went with our client from Japan all the way to Edinburgh Fringe Festival because they were looking to understand how Edinburgh Fringe, which is a massive theater festival that happens each year, how that sort of um, the cultural event is planned. So we basically spent four days there just eating and drinking and watching <laughs> a lot of theater. And I had to introduce them to Game of Thrones and um, interactive comedy shows and things that just they'd never experienced before. And these were all Japanese salary men. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun, actually, really seeing the two worlds collide, but then also basically just getting to have a party for four days. <laughs> so when we get projects like that, that's great. And then also thinking that it's having an impact on one of the biggest events in the world. They're going to use this, or they were supposed to use it this year in 2020. Mm -hmm. That was great as well and very satisfying. Yeah. Oh, that sounds like such an amazing opportunity. So then do you have a specific example of a communication breakdown you've experienced in J when you were back in Japan due to differences in the culture? Yeah, it's really the one that I mentioned earlier is the best example I can think of is introducing an American client to a Japanese client and seeing the breakdown and potential mm -hmm. that there was. I mean, yeah, that, I think that happens all the time, unfortunately. People who are, you know, they're both trying really hard to look for a benefit and the benefit is there, but they both don't see it because culturally they're not aligned. That's, yeah, that happens quite often. So I'd recommend anyone who's going to Japan you know, you don't need to speak Japanese, but just stop and ask questions along the way and give people a chance to explain their viewpoints. And I can see how, especially with Americans, that would be difficult, especially when it comes to first impressions, just because when we're nervous, we like to talk a lot. So yeah, yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I don't know. And just thinking about the way a lot of my non-american friends view american culture as well i see the same thing like people aren't asking questions of each other so they assume things like um i had uh someone who's british and he thought that americans can be quite um inauthentic because they'll say oh i i love you i want to you know see you again we're going to plan another event we're going to do all this great business together and then when you try to follow up they never really follow up back and you think well were they lying to me mm. i tried to explain to him that this is my opinion as an American that in that moment a hundred percent they really meant all of that because we're we want to engage with you right right now but sometimes we're now involved in the next thing <laughs> mm -hmm. because there is a lot of that short-term mentality as well so right. it's hard for people to understand that if they haven't you know grown up around that right there can be a little bit of shiny object syndrome with opportunities too I can see how that would be a little bit disappointing for people who have a different approach to things. Yeah, that's true. And I've definitely had that experience with Tokyo Ask, you know, thinking, oh, I want this project or we're going to do this or this is what we're going to do next. And then realizing, you know, two months later that that was a complete pipe dream. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So then you mentioned kind of cultivating this awareness, cultivating this curiosity about other people's way of thinking but also if somebody was going to japan for business and could maybe only learn one thing from you before they go what else would you teach them oh other than that it's, it's very difficult mm -hmm. um i mean 
yeah, I mean, being being open to connecting with people and you know meeting people that you might not have expected to meet otherwise. So I think that's really key as well because I mean we, again we talked about relationship building, but a lot of those experiences in Japan, whether you're doing business there or just visiting, it comes from those you know authentic connections that you make with people. Those are the best ones, I think. So looking out for that, I would really recommend. And also reading the book you mentioned before would probably also not hurt the culture yeah. map. <laughs> yeah, because I know my co- my copy is just really marked up, and it's all all the Japanese sections are like linked to each other, so I can get to them really easily. So <laughs> my old employee still has my book, and I, I I'm really frustrated by that. Oh I no! Back. <laughs> no, you gotta get that back. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Is there anything you'd like to quickly mention to my audience before we sign off for the day? Sure. So, I mean, I talked a bit about what we do at Tokyo Ask. So if there's anything you think that's relevant or that I could help you with, whether it's a business question or a less business related question, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. And also we post a lot of content and ideas about what we think the differences are between Japan and non-Japan on our website at tokyoesque.com. So feel free to take a look at our blog as well and um, you can get involved that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely second following you on LinkedIn because you always post so much interesting information. So definitely go and follow her on LinkedIn. (laughs) And thank you for having me today. It's really a pleasure to have this kind of conversation. I don't get to do it enough. I hope that you enjoyed today's conversation. Please be sure to check out the links in the description of this episode to learn more about Natalie and Tokyo Esque. Also, please remember to go ahead and subscribe and leave a rating and review if you enjoyed the podcast. And feel free to email me at businesssuccessjapan at gmail.com if you have any other questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes or interview topics. Also, be sure to reach out if you would like to contribute as a guest on the podcast to share your own cultural insights into doing business in Japan. But for now, remember that the more you learn, the more confident you will become as you explore all of the opportunities Japan has to offer you. Until next time, mata konzo! Mm-hmm.